question is a firm has a production function y is equal to k to the power 0.5 times l to the power 0.5 k and l denote the capital and labor and y denotes the output and faces a wage rate w is equal to 4 and rental rate of capital that is r is equal to 4 the firm's marginal cost is we need to find out okay so given this production function okay in place of 0.5 i have written 1 upon 2 no problem wage rate is 4 rental rate of uh, capital is 4 we need to find out the value of marginal cost okay so basically what we need to do here we want to minimize our cost okay so this is a more cost minimization problem so we want to minimize our cost what is cost simply price of labor which is denoted by wage rate that is uh, price of labor times units of labor plus price of capital times units of capital okay so we want to minimize this cost and that is equal to actually so we want to minimize c is equal to so w is 4 l plus r is 4 k we want to minimize this cost subject to the production constraint what is our production constraint that is uh, k to the power 1 upon 2 l to the power 1 upon 2 should be equal to y okay so this is cost minimization problem we can solve this uh, you know problem using Lagrange's function also okay so to form the Lagrange's function first what will we do we will set this you know production constraint equal to zero okay that is uh, we can write it in this form okay that is y minus k to the power 1 upon 2 l to the power 1 upon 2 we set it equal to zero then we multiply it by lambda okay then our language function will be equal to we add the objective function that is objective function will be this function that is in, in specific terms that is wl sorry 4l so 4l plus 4k okay language function is formed by adding up the objective function and this resulting constraint plus lambda y minus k to the power 1 upon 2 l to the power 1 upon 2 okay this is our Lagrange's function then to find the optimal value of l and k we partially differentiate this Lagrange's function with respect to labor and capital okay and solve them simultaneously okay so l subscript l means the partial derivative of this Lagrange's function with respect to l okay so derivative of l is 1 so we are left with 4 here derivative of l uh, here will be equal to so we will get here minus derivative of l to the power 1 upon 2 will be 1 upon 2 uh, then we have k to the power 1 upon 2 l to the power minus 1 upon 2 by power function rule we have l to the power 1 upon 2 its derivative is 1 upon 2 becomes coefficient and exponent is subtracted by 1 so this becomes 1 upon 2 l to the power minus 1 upon 2 this is what I have done here okay and to this we have also lambda okay lambda is multiplied with this then we partially differentiate with respect to k okay if I differentiate partially with respect to k derivative of k is 1 so we are again left with 4 then we have plus into minus which will become minus derivative of k to the power 1 upon 2 will become minus 1 uh, sorry 1 upon 2 k to the power minus 1 upon 2 l to the power 1 upon 2 and we have the lambda okay we only need these two things here let us say if i equate it here okay and we set it equal to zero obviously this is equal to zero this is equal to zero okay to find the optimal values of labor and capital we partially differentiate language's function with respect to labor and capital and set them equal to zero simultaneously okay so let us say this is equation first this is equation second so dividing equation first by equation second we will get uh, okay here we can do one thing uh, okay if I save the space here if I transpose these terms here they will become positive okay so it will become let us write it here equal to sign equal to sign to save the space that means 4 upon 4 will be equal to 
वन अपॉन टू के टू द पावर वन अपॉन टू एल टू द पावर माइनस वन अपॉन टू लेमडा डिवाइड बाई वन अपॉन टू के टू द पावर माइनस वन अपॉन टू एल टू द पावर वन अपॉन टू लेमडा वन अपॉन टू वन अपॉन टू लेमडा लेमडा गेट्स कैंसल फोर फोर गेट्स कैंसल सो वन इज इक्वल टू इफ आई ट्रांसपोज के टू द पावर माइनस वन अपॉन टू हियर इट विल बी मल्टीप्लाइड विद दिस के एंड द एक्सपोनेंट विल एड अप टू वन ओके सो वी विल गेट के हियर सिमिलरली इफ आई ट्रांसपोज एल टू द पावर माइनस वन अपॉन टू टू डी नॉमिनेटर इट विल गेट मल्टीप्लाइड विद दिस के एंड एक्सपोनेंट विल एड अप टू वन सो वी विल गेट के अपॉन एल इज इक्वल टू वन विच इम्प्लाइज यू नो एल इज इक्वल टू के सिंपली प्लग एल इज इक्वल टू के ओके इन टू आवर कंस्ट्रेंट ओके इन प्लेस ऑफ एल आई वे राइट के दैट मीन्स के टू द पावर वन अपॉइंट टू इन प्लेस ऑफ एल अगेन वी हैव के टू द पावर वन अपॉइंट टू इज इक्वल टू वाई ओके बेस इज आर सेम एक्सपोनेंट एड्स अप टू वन दैट मीन्स वी विल गेट के इज इक्वल टू वाई इफ के इज इक्वल टू वाई एंड वी नो दैट k is equal to l that means l is also equal to y okay now we can find out the total cost so our total cost will be equal to so in place of so we have 4 in place of l we got l is equal to y plus 4 in place of k again we got y that means which implies c will be equal to 4y plus 4y is equal to 8y now total cost that is our total cost now what is marginal cost is simply the derivative of cost function with respect to output taking derivative of this cost function with respect to y we will get marginal cost equal to 8 okay so we can also use the mrts condition that means a uh, marginal rate of technical substitution between uh, you know labor and capital should be equal to you know uh, price of labor upon price of capital okay that will be a shortcut uh, method also it gets lengthy okay so you can use also this uh, method that is marginal rate of substitution technical substitution between labor and capital should be equal to uh, uh, you know wage rate upon rental rate of capital mrts is simply okay it is marginal product of cap uh, what we call labor mpl upon एम पी के शुड बी इक्वल टू डब्ल्यू अपॉन आर एम पी एल मीनस द डेरीवेटिव ऑफ यू नो अलहमदिल्ला सॉरी सो एम पी एल इज सिंपली द पार्सल डेरीवेटिव ऑफ प्रोडक्शन फंक्शन विद रेस्पेक्ट टू एल डिवाइड बाई एम पी के इज पार्सल डेरीवेटिव ऑफ प्रोडक्शन फंक्शन विद रेस्पेक्ट टू यू नो के एंड वी सेट इट इक्वल टू price of labor divided by price of capital okay here we can see if we take the de derivative which we uh, took earlier we will get and we got k upon l will be equal to so w and r are same that is 4 and 4 here so it will uh, come out to be equal to 1 that means k will be equal to l okay and our cost function you know is equal to rather uh, we put the value of k is equal to l again into this production uh, constraint that is y will be equal to uh, k to the power 0.5 l to the power 0.5 sorry in place of k we can write l again okay so y will be equal to l if y is equal to l uh, and k is equal to l that means y will be also equal to k simply plug these values into the cost function we know that is equal to wage rate times units of labor plus rental rate of capital times units of capital and c is equal to so this is 4l plus 4k okay so since l is equal to y k is also equal to y c will be equal to 4y plus 4 in place of k we have again y so this is c will be equal to 8y that means this is our total cost function marginal cost is simply the derivative of cost function with respect to output again we will get 8 if we use this very condition that is graphically it simply means if we have labor and capital okay 
given the produ uh, production isocount let us say this is our isocount given this production isocount we want to minimize our cost so cost minimization requires where the iso cost line and iso count are tangent to each other here our m r t s should be equal to the ratio of price of labor upon price of capital okay so corresponding to this we will get optimal bundle plug the value of optimal bundle into the cost function you will get total cost function differentiate the cost function with respect to output you will get the marginal cost the question is in the two period model a consumer is maximizing the present discounted utility which is being denoted by wt is equal to ln of c subscript t that means natural log of current consumption plus one divided by one plus theta times ln of c subscript t plus one that means natural log of future consumption with respect to ct and ct plus one and subject to the following budget constraint that is ct that is current consumption plus future consumption ct plus one divided by one plus r should be less or equal to yt plus yt denoted the current uh, you know income uh, that is the uh, income in the period one plus the future income the uh, income in period uh, you know t plus one divided by one plus r where c subscript i y subscript i are the consumption and income in period i uh, the value of i is equal to t and t plus one theta lies between zero and infinity including zero that is why we have closed uh, interval on the left hand side is the time discount rate and uh, you know rate of interest is uh, the value of r lies between zero and infinity okay including zero here is the rate of interest suppose consumer is in interior equilibrium and theta is equal to 0 0.05 and r is equal to 0 0.0 at in equilibrium the ratio of the future consumption upon current consumption will be equal to we need to find out very that very thing okay it's not bad as well let's see how to solve this question okay so what is our endeavor here we want to maximize this utility function subject to this budget constraint okay so what exactly we want to do we want to maximize wt is equal to ln of uh, ct plus 1 divided by 1 plus theta ln of uh, you know c subscript t plus 1 okay we want to maximize this utility function uh, subject to subject to the intertemporal budget constraint this is our budget constraint that is ct uh, plus c t plus 1 divided by 1 plus r should be less or equal to let us write it equality sign here we have the current consumption plus future consumption discounted at 1 plus r that is the rate of interest okay maximize this subject to this uh, uh, intertemporal budget constraint okay so let's uh, form the leverage function first so l will be equal to okay so first uh, let us say this is our objective function language function is formed by you know adding the objective function and this budget constraint when we set it equal to zero and multiply it by lambda okay so i have explained about the language multiplier i will not be able to uh, explain all the stuff here okay so we write the objective function that is ln of the ct uh, plus 1 divided by 1 plus theta uh, ln of c subscript t plus 1 uh, okay so uh, what will be our uh, budget constraint here first we set all this equal to 0 okay that means if i transpose all these terms here uh, left hand side will be equal to 0 so then we okay let me explain it here so uh, first we set this budget constraint equal to zero so we can write yt plus yt plus one divided by one plus r minus ct minus ct plus one divided by one plus r is equal to zero okay to this then we multiply by lambda okay we add up this you you know objective function and this resulting constraint so our constraint will be equal to that is plus lambda and this uh, function that is yt uh, plus y t plus 1 divided by 1 plus r 
minus C T uh, minus uh, C T plus 1 divided by 1 plus R and it should be equal to 0 okay so you can see we are being told to find out the interior equilibrium that is why we want to find out the optimum uh, bundle here that is the optimal consumption in future and current period okay given this language is function to find the optimal uh, equilibrium what we uh, do here uh, we partially differentiate this uh, you know like Rages function with respect to current consumption and future uh, consumption and set it equal to you know zero okay so to find the optimum uh, we uh, you know partially differentiate this like Rages function with respect to uh, you know current consumption that is l subscript ct okay if i take the derivative of this function with respect to ct so we have ln of ct it is uh, derivative is simply equal to 1 divided by uh, log of ct will be equal to 1 divided by ct simple thing so in place of this i can write 1 divided by ct okay uh, since we are taking the partial derivative with respect to current consumption this is future con consumption the derivative of it will be equal to zero let us see if we have ct here here we have the ct derivative of ct will be one here so we are left with only minus lambda and we set it equal to zero okay symmetrically we take the partial derivative with respect to ct plus one that means uh, partially differentiating this function with respect to future consumption okay so no ct plus one is involved in the first term its derivative will be equal to zero now the derivative of, of let me write it here one plus theta derivative of ln of ct plus one will be equal to one divided by ct plus one simple if we have ln of x its derivative is simply one upon x so in place of x we have ct plus one let us see if we have any ct plus one here we have in the last term the ct plus one and uh, derivative of ct plus one will be one so we are left with minus one upon one plus r and this lambda minus uh, we will have lambda divided by one plus r and we set it equal to zero okay then we uh, partially differentiate with respect to lambda we don't need rook okay, that very stuff here okay let us rewrite it here okay to save the space uh, if i transpose lambda here it will become positive so let us write it here like this and sim similarly if i transpose it here it will become positive okay so it will be like this let us say this is equation first this is equation second dividing equation first by equation second so what will we get uh, so we have okay so we have one upon ct we have 1 upon ct uh, divided by and this stuff 1 upon 1 plus theta times 1 divided by ct plus 1 should be equal to uh, lambda divided by lambda divided by 1 plus r okay so this will if we solve it let me uh, write it here then okay here we will get 1 divided by ct okay uh, if I transpose it to the numerator, it will get reciprocated and multiplied. So we will get uh, 1, okay, it will become 1 plus theta uh, divided by 1 and this will become uh, ct plus 1 divided by 1, okay, should be equal to. Similarly, here we will have lambda divided by 1 into 1 plus r, okay, let me write it here, 1 plus r divided by lambda 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 cancel so we will get here c t plus 1 divided by c t into uh, 1 plus theta is equal to we got here only 1 plus r okay and let me write it here 1 plus r after that uh, we have c t plus 1 divided by c t will be equal to 1 plus r divided by if i transpose it will get divided 1 plus theta okay that is we were told to find out this very stuff we are being given the value of r the value of r is 1.08 okay so in place of 
or I can write 0.08 and in place of theta the value of theta is being given as a 0.05 0.05 okay so this will result in that is ct plus 1 divided by ct will be equal to so it is 1.08 divided by 1.05 you know solving this it will come out to be 1.03 okay so the ratio of future consumption to present consumption the ratio comes out to be 1.03 let us solve a question on three player Nash equilibrium. The question is in a three player game, we have three players player one, player two, and player three. Player one chooses either up or down. Player one chooses either up or down. Uh, as strategies, player two choose sorry, player two can choose either left or right. Either player two can go left or right here, left or right here. Okay, as strategies, player three can choose either table one or table two, either this table or their table we need to find out the Nash equilibrium or Nash equilibrium if we have multiple Nash equilibrium here okay now here you can see the first numbers in each cell denote the payoff of player one second number which is being shown by this you know green color or the payoffs of player second and the black colors or the payoffs of player third okay now let us see how to solve this very uh, game when we have three players let us take uh, the first profile is that is let us suppose player three chooses table one okay and player two chooses left then what are the options for player one okay player three is choosing this table player 2 is choosing left so we have nothing to do with this uh, second table here now then player 1 has options either to go up or down up gives him 3 as payoff down gives him 2 as payoff obviously he will choose 3 3 is greater than 2 okay again let us say player 3 chooses table 1 and this time player 2 chooses right okay what are the options for player one either to go up or to go down up gives him as a payoff of four down gives him five obviously four is uh, less than five so he will choose greater amount here so let us you know underline this again this time let us suppose player three chooses table second and player two chooses left what are the options for player one player one can go either up or down up gives him two down gives him six so obviously he will choose more that means he will choose go down that means we underline this very uh, number again if player three chooses table second and this time player two chooses right what are the options for player one either to go up or down up gives him four down gives him three obviously he will choose four okay so we are done with player one now let's take uh, player two into consideration okay now let us suppose uh, player three chooses table one and player one chooses up okay this time uh, player two has two options either to go left or right so we are you know concerned with these uh, cells here obviously uh, left gives him two as payoff right gives him one as payoff obviously player two will choose left okay now let us suppose player three chooses table one player one chooses down again player two has two options either to go left or right left gives him six payoff right gives him four payoff obviously he will choose better payoff that is six okay let's take this very into consideration let us suppose uh, player three chooses you know table second and player one chooses up again player two has two options 
either to go left or right we are concerned with this row either to go left or right for player 2 obviously left gives him 3 right gives him 5 so obviously he will choose more as player that is 5 again player 3 chooses table 2 and this time player 1 chooses down this time also player 2 has two options either to go left or go right left gives him say four is payoff right gives him three is payoff obviously four is greater than three he will choose four okay we are done with player one and two now we need to find out the optimal strategies for player three okay so let's suppose okay we need to find out which table will uh, player three choose let us suppose player 1 chooses up, player 2 chooses left. Obviously, he has to compare table 1 and table 2. So, here again in table 2, player 1 chooses up, player 2 chooses left. That means we are concerned with this cell and with this cell, okay? So, um, here, uh, going for table 1 gives him payoff of 5. Going for table 2 gives him payoff of 4. Obviously, 5 is greater than 4. He will choose to go for table 1. Okay? Again, let us say player 1 chooses to go up and player uh, you know two chooses to go right this very cell also here player one chooses up let us say player two chooses to go right what are the options for player three he has to compare this cell with this cell okay here he is choosing between table one and table two here you can see uh, going for table one gives him payoff of three going for table uh, second gives him pay up of seven obviously he will choose going table going for table two okay again let us say player one chooses to go down and player two chooses to go left what are the options okay let me write it here player one chooses to go down and player one chooses to go left so what are the options for player 3 either to go for table 1 or table 2 here you can see down and left so this cell um, down and left that means this cell so we will be comparing this one with zero going for table 1 gives him 1 as payoff going for table 2 gives him 0 as payoff obviously 1 is greater than 0 so he will choose table 1 okay again uh, let us say player one goes down but this time player two goes right here also player uh, one goes down and player two goes right what are the options for player three either to go for this cell or to go for this cell here when player one has chosen down player two has chosen right the payoff for player 3 is here 6 and here when player 1 chooses to go down and player 2 chooses to go right the payoff payoff is here 3 obviously 6 is greater than 3 he will choose this 6 okay now what are the Nash equilibrium here by Nash equilibrium what we mean Nash equilibrium occurs when each player chooses his optimal strategy given the other players have also chosen their optimal strategies and in this table Nash equilibria will be there where all the elements in a cell are underlined here we can say see all the cells are here underlined that means we have this Nash equilibrium and here also we have these cells you know underlined then what are the strategy prof uh, profile for Nash equilibrium? So we have strategy uh, profile 
that is player one goes up okay let us write player one goes up then uh, uh, player two chooses left so we have left and player three chooses table one table one this is one nash equilibrium okay ego mushi thrown problem next is four five seven and what is this strategy profile that is player one chooses right so let's write it here right uh, player sorry sorry player one chooses up here okay up it is here it is up player two chooses right And player three chooses table two. These are the Nash equilibrium in this, uh, you know, payoff matrix when we have three players. Okay. I hope I make myself clear. The question is to find out the per capita output growth rate. The question is a production function at a time t is given by that is y t is equal to a t k to the power alpha times l to the power 1 minus alpha subscript is time here t alpha lies between 0 and 1 and alpha is not equal to 0 0.5 where y is the output k is the capital l is the labor a is the state of technology what we also call total factor productivity we define per capita a is that is uh, defined by small y t is equal to capital y t divided by capital l t okay that means output per worker and capital output ratio is being defined by ct is equal to kt divided by yt actually it is here uh, you know uh, capital output ratio is being denoted by small kt i will not be able to differentiate between you know uh, capital k and small uh, k here that's why i have written uh, you know uh, c in place of capital output ratio so our capital output ratio is ct is equal to kt upon yt for any variable if we have a variable xt, its derivative with respect to time, that is dxt upon dt is being denoted by x dot, we have to find out the per capita output growth rate, okay? What we are being given? We are being given the production function. Let's write it here. So we have yt is equal to at uh, kt raised power alpha times lt raised power 1 minus alpha this is our production function we are being told that capital output ratio is being given us that is ct is equal to kt divided by and let me write it here our capital output ratio is c subscript t is equal to kt divided by yt let me repeat it here again uh, in question capital output ratio is being denoted by small k here i cannot differentiate between capital k and it will get confused that's why i am using c here okay so our capital output ratio is being given here this output ratio can be also written in this form that means our kt will be equal to kt is equal to ct which is capital output ratio times yt what will we do we simply plug kt is equal to this step into our production function that means our yt will be equal to we have at in place of kt i will write ct yt okay so we have ct times yt raised power alpha then we have lt raised power 1 minus alpha okay that implies okay uh, if we uh, write it we can write our yt is equal to yt is equal to uh, 
and let me write it here we have 80 uh, we have ct raised power alpha let's write it here ct raised power alpha times yt raised power alpha times lt raised power 1 minus alpha okay after that what will we do we will divide both sides by you know y raised power alpha in this equation and let's write it here to make things more clear so we have yt is equal to at ct raised power alpha yt raised power alpha lt raised power 1 minus alpha dividing both sides by yt raised power alpha that is yt raised power alpha here and to this also we divide by yt raised power alpha so yt uh, and yt raised power alpha it can be written in this fashion theta sum is r so we have basically same we can uh, subtract the exponents we will get 1 minus alpha as exponent is equal to here yt alpha yt alpha gets cancelled and let us we are left with 80 then we have ct which denotes capital output ratio raised power alpha here then we have l t raised power 1 minus alpha okay now let's transpose this exponent to rhs this exponent this exponent will remain exponent but in reciprocal uh, reciprocal order okay sorry for my broken english okay so i can write it in this fashion that is yt is equal to uh, we have at ct raised power alpha lt raised power 1 minus alpha okay when i transpose exponent it will become exponent but in reciprocal order, uh, reciprocal order 1 minus alpha okay let's uh, you know simplify here rather uh, let's write it here that means our yt is equal to so we have at raised power 1 upon 1 minus alpha okay then we have ct raised power alpha divided by so this one uh, divided by one minus alpha i am expanding it so we have one minus alpha here also then we have lt we have one minus alpha of this and we get this one minus alpha also so our equation reduces to this gets cancelled that means our yt is equal to yt is equal to a t raised power 1 upon 1 minus alpha uh, we have ct uh, alpha divided by 1 minus alpha and here we are left with only l t since we have to find out the per capita output growth rate that means we want to find out the output per worker so this is our total output to this we divide by lt this will give us the output per worker if i divide on lhs i have to divide through rhs also to balance the equation so we have lt here also okay so yt divided by lt that means output per worker and let us define it by small y okay so small yt is equal to we have here a t raised power 1 upon 1 minus alpha then we have ct raised power alpha divided by 1 minus alpha okay now what we need to do we take log on both sides okay let's take log on both sides that means 
NR log hai yet. Chalo ye mein se to log. That means log of yt will be equal to. So if we have log, if we have let us say m raised power n, its log is simply equal to n log m. Okay, n becomes coefficient, and that will happen here also with one divided by one minus alpha. So we will get one divided by one minus alpha log of at plus. Okay, I know you know this basic uh, logarithm uh, rules. Again, this coefficient this will become coefficient that is alpha divided by one minus alpha, and we have log of ct. Okay. Having said that, after that, what will we do? Kya karuga? Let me see if I have space here. I have space left here to make the calculation. Tranam ganam. So, difference here both sides with respect to time. Log of yt will be equal to the derivative of log of yt. First, log of y is 1 upon y. So, we will get 1 upon, let me see if I am, oh, okay, I am visible, log of, uh, the derivative of log of y is 1 upon y t times dy t divided by dt. Okay, so this log y t, its derivative is simply 1 upon y uh, times dy. Since we have time function here, so we will get dy upon dt is equal to again we have 1 divided by you know, so we have 1 upon 1 minus alpha okay now what is derivative of log 80 again simple thing it is 1 divided by 80 and then we take derivative of d 80 with respect to time that is dt plus again we have alpha divided by 1 minus alpha log of ct is equal to 1 divided by ct times dct divided by dt we are being told here and let us see if we have a variable xt it is being denoted by the derivative of this xt with respect to time is being denoted by x dot okay dyt divided by dt it is the derivative okay so this will be defined by let us denote it by y bar that means we will get <coughs> so let us uh, draw this subscript here it is uh, you know to make things clear so dy t divided by dt is equal to and let's write it here so in this place i can write yt so it will become numerator so we have y dot divided by y is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus alpha okay then this is being denoted by a dot okay so in this place i can write a dot divided by we have this a here plus we have alpha divided by one minus alpha and this is being denoted by c dot okay let us denote it by c dot and to this we have divided by c c is here okay so uh, in place of uh, you know c we have actually k dot that means i have written c in place of capital labor ratio sorry capital output ratio so our equation will become y dot divided by y is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus alpha a dot divided by a plus alpha divided by 1 minus alpha times so in place of this we have k dot divided by K. This should be the answer to the given equation, to the given question.
Let us solve a question that was asked in GM Economics paper of 2023. The question is, if x star y star is the optimal solution of this problem, that is, maximize f of x y is equal to 100 minus e to the power minus x minus e to the power uh, negative y, subject to the constraint e times x plus y is equal to e divided by e minus 1, where x and y are both positive quantities, then under root of uh, y star upon x star is equal to we need to find out that very thing okay so what we are being given we are being given the you know uh, the objective function that means we want to maximize our objective function that is f of x y is equal to 100 minus e to the power minus x minus e to the power minus y okay and we have the constraint here like we have the budget constraint uh, in economics that is e to the power x sorry e, uh, e times x e is the exponential function here okay plus y should be equal to e upon e minus 1 okay first thing is what will we do we will set this constraint equal to 0 that is we will form the Lagrange's function the first step is to set this constraint equal to 0 that is uh, you know uh, e divided by e minus 1 to this we subtract uh, e x minus y and we set it equal to 0 and after that what we do we multiply this resulting constraint with lambda after that we form the Lagrange's function such that uh, we add the given you uh, what we call here objective function which is 100 minus e to the power minus x minus e to the power minus y to this we add this resulting constraint that is lambda bracket e divided by e minus 1 minus e x minus y this is our Lagrange's function now to find the optimal values of x and y what we do we partially differentiate this Lagrange's function first with respect to x and set it equal to 0 and then with respect to y and set it equal to 0 and solve them simultaneously let's take the partial derivative of this function with respect to x l subscript x means the partial derivative of this Lagrange's function with respect to x okay so uh, here we have the function e minus e to the power minus x its derivative with respect to x will be minus e raised power minus x times minus 1 okay this function and the coefficient of this exponent here that means the derivative of x is here one so we write this here okay if we have uh, e to the power minus nx its derivative is simply e to the power nx that is minus nx times the derivative of x which is here one so we are left with minus n i am just following this very procedure here so this becomes here minus into minus is plus we will get e to the power minus x so derivative of constant is 0 derivative of this term came out to be you know e to the power minus x e to the power minus x since we are taking partial derivative with respect to x derivative of this will be also equal to 0 here no uh, x is involved here we have the x derivative of x here will be 1 so we will be left with minus e and we set it equal to 0 this is the partial derivative of Lagrange's function with respect to x uh, symmetrically we take the partial derivative uh, with respect to y okay so uh, here we have minus e to the power minus y its derivative with respect to y will be equal to minus e raised power minus y derivative of y is 1 so we mul multiply it with minus 1 so minus into minus is plus again we get e to the power minus y so we get e to the power minus y okay uh, here we have y in this last term so its derivative will be here 1 so we will be left with minus 1 and we set it equal to 0 after that or uh, let's solve them here first okay we can write it in this fashion e to the power minus x is equal to e if i transpose it here and here it implies e to the power minus y is equal to 1 let us say this is equation first this is equation second after that what we do we divide equation first with equation second that means 1 divided by 2 
is equal to so we have e to the power minus x divided by e to the power minus y it should be equal to e upon 1 is equal to e or we can write it in this fashion let's transpose numerator to denominator and denominator to numerator so exponent sign gets changed so we will get e to the power y if i transpose it to the numerator and if i transpose this numerator it's exp uh, you know exponent sign will get changed and it will become e to the power x should be equal to e that means we can write this expression in this form that is e to the power y minus x y minus x is equal to e to the power 1 okay since we have the same base here we can equate the exponents that implies y minus x should be equal to 1 which implies x plus 1 is equal to y here x plus or we can write it in this fashion that is our uh, x is equal to y minus 1 we plug the value of x is equal to y minus 1 into the constraint function so we have e in place of y in place of x we have y minus 1 plus we have y should be equal to e upon e minus 1 or let's multiply here we will get e y minus e plus y is equal to e upon e minus 1 so we have e y plus y e y plus y is equal to e divided by e minus 1 transposing this e it will get added or we can take y common and we will be left with e plus 1 on the r you know on lhs here let's multiply so we have e uh, plus then we have e square e plus e square minus e divided by e minus 1 so e and e gets cancelled let me see if i have the space to write the other stuff here okay i am do, doing it uh, you know by step by step you can do it uh, you know pretty fast there in examination rather you have done you would have done it pretty faster so here we get e square upon e minus 1 e square divided by e minus 1 if i transpose it it will get multiplied so we will get 1 divided by e plus 1 when i transpose it this here so it becomes e square divided by e minus 1 e plus 1 so that is a square minus b square the formula so we will get e square minus 1 so this is the value of y so y is equal to this now what will be uh, the value of x since we know x is equal to y minus 1 so this is our y that is e square uh, divided by e square minus 1 to this we subtract 1 which gives us x will be equal to uh, so here we have e square then multiplying minus e square minus into minus is plus 1 divided by e square minus 1 so e square e square gets cancelled we get 1 divided by e square minus 1 we got the value of x star and y star let us say this is our y star which is equal to this stuff and this is our x star which is equal to this stuff but we need to find out uh, under root of y star upon x star okay so let me see if i can write it here so our y star upon x star will be equal to so y star we got it equal to e square divided by e square minus 1 to this we divide x star which is 1 divided by uh, e square minus 1 which implies our y star upon x star will be equal to e square divided by e square minus 1 transposing this it will get multiplied and reciprocated so e square minus 1 divided by 1 this and this gets cancelled that means our y star upon x star came out to be e square but we need to find out under root of y star okay so we have y star upon x star since we want to find the under root so let us so it is equal to e square here since we want to find under root let us put under root here then we have to 
put under root sign here also so square and root gets cancelled that means under root y star upon x star okay is equal to e and we know the value of e is 2. Point, uh, you know 7 1 8 something like this 2.718 that means since we have to take two decimal places we can write it as 2.72 2.72 will be the answer let us solve a question on three firm Carnot Nash equilibrium the question is an industry has three firms there is firm one firm two and firm three in Carnot competition they have no fixed costs and their constant marginal costs are respectively marginal cost of firm 1 is 9 upon 30 marginal cost of firm 2 is 10 upon 30 and similarly c3 denotes the marginal cost of firm 3 which is 11 upon 30 they face an industry demand function that is being shown by p is equal to 1 minus q where p is the market price and q is the industry output that is the sum of outputs of three firms suppose that q subscript c is the industry output under carnot nash equilibrium we need to find out the value of you know q subscript inverse sorry q subscript c it's inverse we need to find out the value okay since it is, it is a carnot uh, you know model firms will compete in terms of prices okay let us first write our you know demand function so our demand function will be equal to p will be equal to 1 minus this q denotes the output of three firms so we can write it in this fashion that means in place of q i can write q1 plus q2 plus q3 okay so here in place of q if i write this we have to subtract with this then it becomes q1 minus q2 minus q3 okay this is our inverse demand function now we take uh, three firms one by one first we find uh, first we will find out the marginal revenue of firm one and we will equate it with its marginal cost then we will take marginal revenue of firm two and equate it with uh, its marginal cost and lastly the marginal revenue of firm three and equate with it is marginal cost okay let's take firm one in consideration first so uh, to find uh, you know marginal revenue we need to find out the total revenue and we know total revenue is simply equal to uh, p into output that is q1 so this is our p that is 1 minus q1 minus q2 minus q3 to this we multiply q1 okay so our uh, total revenue will be equal to uh, q1 minus q1 square minus q1 q2 minus q1 q3 okay now what is marginal revenue marginal revenue of firm one marginal revenue of firm one will be equal to simply uh, differentiating this with respect to q1 okay let's denote it by tr prime okay so if i take the partial derivative of this function with respect to q1 so derivative of q1 will be 1 derivative of q1 square will be 2 q1 derivative of q1 in this term is 1 so we are left with q2 and here derivative of q1 again is 1 so we are left with q3 okay that means this is our marginal revenue now we equate marginal revenue with marginal cost that means marginal revenue of firm 1 should be equal to the marginal cost of firm 1 marginal revenue is being given by this very function that is and let me write it here i don't have the space so we have 1 minus 2 q1 minus q2 minus q3 we equate it with the marginal cost of firm 1 is you know 9 upon 30 and we can write it uh, you know 1 upon 10 okay if i transpose these terms here they will become positive and if i transpose 1 upon 10 here it will become negative so we have this stuff twice q1 plus q2 plus q3 so this gives us the arct so this uh, comes out to be so we have here uh, 3 3s are 9 
three tens are thirty. Let me see if I have done some any, uh, any mistake here. So we have three threes are nine, three tens are thirty. So it is actually three upon thirty. Okay, so three upon ten. So we have three upon ten. Sorry for this mistake. Now ten minus three comes out to be seven upon ten. Should be equal to twice q1 plus q2 plus q3. Okay. So what will we get? We will get uh, twice q1 plus q2 plus q3 will be equal to 7 upon 10. Okay. This what we call the reaction function of firm 1. If we solve it for q1, I don't need to solve it for firm 1. We will get the reaction function of firm 1. That means uh, by reaction function what we mean output decide output level decided by firm 1 when firm 2 and 3 have you know decided decided some level of output to be produced okay we don't need uh, to find out uh, the reaction function here okay let us say this is our one equation after that let's take firm 2 into the consideration okay in firm 2 you you will see I don't have the space uh, here so let me try for firm 2 also to make sense for you people so total revenue for firm 2 will be equal to p into q2 okay so our p is this function that is uh, let me write it here 1 minus q1 minus q2 minus q3 to this we multiply q2 so this will become uh, q2 minus q1 q2 minus q2 square minus q2 q3 okay this is total revenue what is marginal revenue marginal revenue for firm 2 will be if we take the partial derivative of this function with respect to q2 so we will get 1 minus q1 minus twice q2 minus q3 okay Again, we equate it with the marginal cost. That means marginal revenue 1 should be equal to the marginal cost of firm 1. Marginal revenue is this function. Okay. So, let's uh, rewrite it here. Okay. We have 1 minus Q1 minus 2 Q2 minus Q3. We equate it it's, uh, with its marginal cost. 10 upon uh, 30, we can write it as 1 upon 3. Transposing these terms, they will become positive. Transposing this term, it will get subtracted with this one. So we will get Q1 plus twice Q2 plus Q3. So this comes out to be 2 upon 3 will be equal to Q1 plus twice Q2 uh, plus Q3. Okay. So uh, we will get another equation that is uh, Q1 plus Q2 plus Sorry, we have Q1 plus twice Q2. Coalition can come back. So we have Q1 plus twice Q2 plus Q3 is equal to, you know, 2 upon 3. Symmetrically, if we solve for Q3. Okay. If I solve for Q3, what will I get? simple thing so uh, we have this very stuff you uh, i will left that very thing for you as an exercise that means for firm 3 what will we get uh, for firm 3 when we write total revenue of firm 3 will be equal to p into q3 okay then you will find out marginal revenue and equate with marginal cost okay that means we will get this kind of equation that is q1 plus twice sorry q1 plus q2 q2 plus twice q3 okay we have 1 minus 11 upon 30 so this comes out to be trahane kata kunu divided by 30 so you will get this very equation 19 divided by 30 when you solve for firm q3 now we have three equations with three unknowns. We need to find out that very stuff. 
we will use the creamers rule here in solving this i don't know whether there is any shortcut to solve this question okay and i am really uh, surprised why um, you know such a long numerical question has been asked in the exam so we have three equations with three unknowns that is we have twice q1 plus q2 plus q3 is equal to 7 upon 10 then we have this for firm 2 we have q1 plus twice q2 plus q3 is equal to 2 upon 3 and for third uh, we have q1 plus q2 plus twice q3 is equal to 19 upon 30 okay three equations with three unknowns we use creamer's rule here in solving this we form we write it in matrix form in such a manner that means a times x is equal to b where a denotes the coefficient matrix and let me write it here so what will be the coefficient matrix that means the coefficient of q1 q2 and q3 so the coefficient of q1 is here 2 here 1 and 1 so i can write 2 1 1 then we have 1 2 1 then we have 1 1 2 x denotes the solution vector that we want to find in place of x that means we want to find the value of q1 q2 and q3 should be equal to vector of constant terms here that is we have 7 upon 10 2 upon 3 19 upon 30 okay now first we need to find out the determinant of this very and let let me see if i have any space here first i need to find out the determinant of this very matrix okay how do we find out the determinant and i guess i should rub this out now we are we have nothing to do with this stuff okay and let me rub this out then it will make sense so first step is we found out we find out the determinant of this matrix that means a will be equal to how do we find a determinant you know it pretty well the De determinant of this so this denotes a this is our a this is our x and all the stuff so determinant is simply uh, found found out by we write the first term for uh, okay to this we multiply we mentally delete this row and this column and take determinant of remaining elements that means 2 to the 4 minus 1 so we will get 4 minus 1 then we write minus and it is from the formula minus and we write the next term which is 1 this term 1 to this we multiply what we mentally delete the row and the column in which this one appears and take the determinant of the remaining elements that means we multiply these two elements two ones are two minus one ones are one then we write plus so first is plus then minus then plus we write plus one this one and mentally delete the row and the column in which it appears and take determinant of the remaining elements so we have one ones are one minus one two the two solving this okay you will get determinant equal to four okay i don't have time space and energy here to do all the stuff here okay now to find the value of q1 the optimal quantity of q1 and let us write here uh, to find the value of q1 what will we do i will not write here i don't have the luxury of you know so my space to find the value of q1 we form new matrix and let me write it here we form a new matrix let us denote it by a1 such that again to find the value of q1 we form new matrix such that we replace first column of this matrix with the vector of constant terms 
okay so in place of 211 we write the vector of constant term that is 7 upon 10 2 upon 3 and 19 upon 30 and other uh, stuff remains the same that is 1 2 1 then we have 1 1 2 okay let me repeat it again to find the value of q1 we replace first column of this coefficient matrix with the vector of constant terms okay and take determinant of this new matrix that means determinant of this a1 will be equal to again or let's write the determinant here okay i don't have space sorry for this a1 will be equal to again how do we find determinant we write the first term first that is 7 upon 10 to this we multiply uh, we uh, we delete the row and the column in which it appears and take the determinant of the remaining elements that means 2 2 are 4 1 1 are 1 so 4 minus 1 is 3 so we will get here 3 then we write minus then this term uh, this one and mentally delete the row and the column in which it appears and take determinant of the remaining elements Okay, so this is 2 upon 3 into 2 it becomes 4 upon 3 minus 9 uh, this term and with this 19 upon 30 Then we have First is plus minus then we have Plus again plus 1 now we uh, this time uh, delete this row and this column and take determinant of the remaining elements so what are the remaining elements uh, we have 2 upon 3 2 upon 3 minus so here 2 so it will become 15 so we have 19 upon 15 when you take the determinant we will get the value of a1 equal to okay let me uh, write it here we will get the value of a1 is you know 4 upon 5 4 upon 5 okay now what will be the value of q1 q1 that means quantity uh, you know supplied by firm 1 will be equal to the determinant of this new matrix that is a1 divided by the determinant of the coefficient matrix that will be equal to so here we have 4 upon 5, 4 upon 5, to this we divide this 4, this will become 4 upon 5 uh, into 1 upon 4, that means we will get 1 upon 5, that means quantity supplied by firm 1 will be equal to 1 upon 5, same logic to find the value of you know, uh, Q2, what will we do? We will form new matrix. Now, to find the value of Q2, we form a new matrix. Let's denote it by, let me see if I have the space, okay? So, to find out the value of Q2, we form a new matrix. To find the value of this Q2, we form a new matrix in such a way, we replace the second column of the coefficient matrix with the vector of constant terms that means our new matrix will be equal to 2 1 1 in place of 1 2 1 we have 7 upon 10 7 upon 10 2 upon 3 kunu upon 3 then we have uh, 1 1 2 1 1 2 okay then we take its determinant in this fashion that means we will get a2 will be equal to I have solved it I don't know if there is any you know shortcut to uh, solve this question okay so a2 when we take the determinant of this matrix we will get I have solved it it comes out to be 2 upon 3 okay that means quantity uh, uh, supplied by firm 2 will be equal to the determinant of this new matrix a2 divided by the determinant of coefficient matrix that is a which will be equal to uh, 2 upon 3 so we got here 2 upon 3 2 upon 3 divided by 4 it comes out to be 1 upon 6 okay 
that means quantity supplied by firm 2 will be equal to 1 upon 6. Again, so this stuff is for this stuff is for firm 2. Okay. Now to find the output level produced by firm 3, we form new matrix. Let's denote it by okay why i am taking determinant first we form a new matrix a3 in such a way okay to find the value of q3 we form a new matrix in such a way we replace the third element simple thing in uh, in the first to find the q1 we replace first element to find the value of q2 we replace second to find the value of q3 we replace the third so we have 211 211 121 then we have in place of this we write 7 upon 10 2 upon 3 and 19 upon 30 taking determinant of this that is uh, the determinant of a3 will be equal to okay using this uh, procedure you will get um, the value of uh, a3 equal to a divided by 15 then q3 will be equal to q3 will be equal to determinant of this a3 divided by determinant of a so we have 8 upon 15 8 upon 15 to this we divide by this 4 so we will get 2 upon 15 okay that means quantity supplied by firm 3 is 2 upon 15 now we need to find out we know that q is equal to Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. That is being told us that Q is the industry output, sum of outputs of three firms. So Q1 is equal to, so we calculate it, can I calculate that? This is 1 upon 5 plus output produced by firm 2, 1 upon 6, 1 upon 6 plus output produced by firm 3 is 2 upon 50 okay that will be our q super script c that means uh, industry output under Carnot nash equilibrium when you add up this it will come out to be 1 upon 2 okay but we need to find out see here we got q c Q subscript C is equal to 1 upon 2. But we need to find out Q subscript C inverse. Okay. That means we inverse that. We write 1 upon 2 inverse. Okay. So, if we have 1 upon 2 inverse, we can write it in this fashion. 1 raised power minus 1 divided by 2 raised power minus 1. We can reciprocate numerator with denominator, exponent sign will change, exponent sign will get changed, so we will get 2 upon 1, which comes out to be 2. That means industry output, uh, that means Q inverse will be equal to 2. Okay, I hope my I make myself clear. Let us learn how to calculate GDP deflator and inflation rate. Uh, from the given data, the question is consider the following table. Assume only apples and bananas are produced in an economy. Also, we assume that 2010 is the base year in this data. Okay, so we are being given year here, uh, price of apple uh, in different years, quantity of apples in different years, price of banana in different years, and quantity of banana. We need to calculate the GDP deflator and inflation rate. Okay. So by GDP deflator, what we mean? GDP deflator, uh, we also call it implicit price deflator also. It is used to measure inflation, okay? So it is used to determine the level of prices of the newly domestically produced, uh, you know, final goods and services in an economy in an year. And how do we calculate the GDP deflator? deflator? Let us see. So uh, for 2011, okay? So uh, to calculate, uh, you know, GDP deflator, the formula is simple. Uh, GDP deflator is equal to nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. Okay, this formula gives us the GDP deflator. Okay, so for 2011, 
okay for 2011 first we need to uh, find out the nominal gdp okay so nominal gdp for 2000 let us denote it by n gdp that means nominal gdp in 2011 is simply equal to and uh, you know the quantity of apples times uh, their price so we have 100 into 1 plus the quantity of banana times the uh, you know price of banana that is 100 uh, into 2 so this comes out to be you know this is 200 and 100 this comes out to be 300 okay and we also need to calculate the real gdp for 2011 so real gdp is simply how do we calculate the real gdp simply uh, we take the current year you know quantity and multiply it with the base year price that means current year quantity is 100 base year price of uh, apple is uh, you know one so our uh, we have 200 into one so this one is actually uh, the base year price plus uh, you know uh, the quantity of banana which is 100 into the base year price of uh, you know banana which is again uh, you know two so this comes out to be 300 that means uh, the real uh, what we call the deflator is equal to so deflator will be equal to gdp deflator for 2011 nominal gdp we calculated it is as uh, you know 300 300 divided by real gdp we calculated it is 300 again into 100 okay so which comes out to be 100 that means the gdp deflator for 2011 is 100 let's calculate uh, for 2012 2012 again first we need to calculate the nominal uh, gdp okay for 2012 simply uh, nominal gdp will be equal to you know price into uh, current price into uh, current quantity so current price is 2 current quantity is 200 so we have 200 into the price of apple in current year that is 2 plus the price of uh, you know quantity of banana is 100 uh, times the price of banana is 4 so which comes out to be 400 plus 400 which comes out to be 800 and what is the real gdp then real gdp for the year 2012 is equal to okay to calculate the real gdp we multiply current year you know quantity with base year prices so we have 200 is the current quantity and base year price is one so we write here one plus same for this so current year quantity of banana is 100 and we multiply it with the base year price which is 2 so which comes out to be 200 plus 200 which comes out to be 400 okay for 2012 what is the gdp deflator then so gdp deflator for 2012 is equal to nominal gdp we calculated it as 800 divided by real gdp which is 400 to this we multiply 100 this gives us the gdp deflator for 2012 which comes out to be a divided by 4 is 2 times uh, 100 which comes out to be 200 okay so this is how do we calculate the gdp deflator now to calculate the inflation rate okay let me rub this out so to calculate the inflation rate we can calculate it uh, by inflation what we mean uh, inflation uh, you know is the change in the price level price level over time okay so inflation is the percentage uh, change in the uh, you know cpi between two years let let me uh, show how to calculate first uh, consumer price index okay so to calculate inflation we need to calculate the consumer price index so uh, let us denote cpi that is consumer price index for two base year will be equal to let's denote it by 2010 that means consumer price index for 2010 which is base year which is equal to okay we add up the prices of apples and banana so we have 2 plus 1 is 3 so we write the current prices with and divide it again with the current prices okay i am calculating cpi for base year and to this we multiply 100 so base year will be always equal to 100 
or thousand you can multiply uh, it uh, you know sometimes uh, by uh, thousand so it will be always uh, like you know hundred or thousand we take it as the base year okay then what will be the cpi for uh, you know 2010 so sorry 2011 cpi for 2011 will be equal to you know the current year prices date minus price of banana is 2 plus 1 is 3 to this we divide the base year prices so sum of base year prices is 1 plus 2 which is again 3 and to this we multiply 100 that means cpi for 2011 is again 100 and uh, symmetrically what will be the cpi for uh, you know 2012 2012 so uh, for uh, 2012 we add up the current year prices of 2012 that is 4 plus 2 which is 6 to this we divide by the base year prices that is 2 plus 1 which is 3 and to this we multiply by 100 so we get here 6 divided by 3 is 2 so we get here 200 okay now we can calculate the inflation rate so inflation rate for 2000 uh, you know so let uh, let's denote you know inflation rate by pi okay so inflation rate for 2011 will be equal to and uh, uh, let uh, you know uh, remember that inflation is along rather i will say inflation is always uh, between two periods okay between 2011 and 12 or uh, between 2010 and 11 so inflation is always you know calculated between two periods of time okay so inflation for 2011 will be equal to the cpi consumer price index in 2011 minus consumer price index in 2010 to this we divide by uh, cpi uh, in 2010 okay we calculated cpi in 2011 which is 100 to this we multiply uh, by 100 percent it gives us the inflation rate so inflation rate will be equal to so 2011 the cpi is 100 minus uh, cpi of 2010 is 100 divided by 100 into 100 percent that means inflation rate for 2011 will be equal to 100 minus 100 is zero so all step becomes zero so we have zero percent okay so inflation rate for 2000 you know 11 is zero percent and what is the inflation rate for 2012 2012 will be equal to cpi uh, you know in 2012 minus cpi in 2011 divided by uh, cpi in 2011 to this we multiply by 100 percent so cpi in uh, 2012 we calculated it is 200 for 2011 we calculated cpi is 100 to this we divide by cpi of 2011 which is 100 so this is uh, you know actually uh, 200 minus 100 comes out and to this we multiply by uh, 100 percent so this comes out to be 2 minus 1 so it comes out to be 100 percent okay that means inflation rate for period 2012 is 100 percent okay both uh, you know inflation inflation rate can also be uh, you know calculated using the gdp deflator and uh, we can also see the inflation rate uh, you know uh, between two periods here we got uh, you know the inflation rate for 2011 is sorry gdp deflator for 2011 is 100 gdp deflator for 2012 is you know 200 and uh, we can also use this to calculate the inflation rate simply uh, so let us show uh, the deflator here so uh, inflation rate for 2012 
will be equal to you know deflator value in 2012 minus deflator value in 2011 divided by deflator value in 2011 again you will see we will get 200 minus to this we multiply by 100 uh, okay 100 percent obviously so uh, 2012 we have 200 so we have 200 minus you know 100 divided by 100 again to this we multiply by 100 percent we will get you know 100 percent is you know inflation rate for 2012 if we use the gdp deflator method and what is the value of uh, you know uh, gdp deflator for base year you can also um, calculate it like we calculated the cpi for the base year okay so gdp deflator for base year will be equal to and let me show it here uh, gdp deflator will be equal to the nominal gdp so nominal gdp nominal gdp will be equal to real gdp okay divided by real gdp into 100 and in the base year nominal gdp and real gdp are same that means so what is nominal gdp uh, 100 into 1 plus 50 into 2 so 100 so this comes out to be 100 plus 100 so that is uh, 100 divided by 100 into 100 okay so this will give us the gdp deflator for the base year 2010 which will come out to be 100 like uh, we have the base year uh, cpi uh, you know uh, index as 100 uh, in the same way uh, the gdp deflator for base year is always equal to 100 or 1000 whatever you take it here uh, you know for the sake of simplicity we take 100 and at times we use 1000 okay so this is how we calculate uh, you know the gdp deflator and uh, to calculate the inflation rate okay so we can also always use gdp deflator okay in calculating the inflation rate or we can use the cpi method in calculating the inflation rate how to find compound annual growth rate of per capita GDP? The question is using the following table. We are being given the year here are 2010 and 2020. Population in 2010 is being given as 20,000 and in uh, 2020 it is 25,000. And GDP in 2010 is 25,000 and 40,000 in 2020. We need to find out the average growth rate compounded annually of per capita GDP in an economy during the period of 2010 to 2020. Okay, how do we calculate it? So first thing is we need to find out the per capita GDP. And let's add on another column here that is per capita GDP that is per capita GDP. So per capita GDP is simply, you know, total GDP, that means total GDP divided by total population. That means uh, 25,000, 25,000 divided by 20,000. And similarly, per capita GDP in 2020 will be 40,000 divided by 25,000. Okay. Now, how do we found compound annual growth rate that is simply being given by the formula that is the final final you know per capita gdp let's denote it by per capita uh, gdp by this pcy divided by initial initial per capita gdp raise power 1 divided by number of years minus 1 okay this is the formula simple thing so final per, uh, per capita gdp means the per capita gdp in 2020 that is equal to let's remove these here 
so it comes out to be 40 upon 25 which comes out to be you know 8 uh, divided by 5 so here it will be 8 divided by 5 divided by what is initial GDP in 2010 here let's remove these so here we will get uh, this comes out to be 5 upon 4 5 upon 4 raised power 1 divided by so from 2010 to 20 so number of years is equal to 10 to this we subtract 1 okay when we solve this it will come out to be it will become 32 divided by 25 raised power 0 0.1 minus 1 which comes out to be 1.28 raised power 0 0.11 okay 1 upon 10 can be written as 0 0.1 minus 1 which comes out to be 1.02499 minus 1 which comes out to be you know 0 0.02499 and if we uh, you know see this is our CAGR if we convert it into percentage so let us multiply it by 100 percent so it will come out to be 2.50 percent that means uh, average growth rate compounded annually of per capita GDP will be equal to 2.50 percent okay the question is let E be the area of the region bounded by two curves y is equal to x square and y is equal to 8 under root x x greater or equal to 0 then 30 times e is equal to we need to find out okay what we are being given we are being given the curves as and let's write it here y is equal to x square this is our first curve and let's draw the graph to make it more you know understandable understandable so we have y on this side x on this side so this is a you know a x square function square root function so its area rather uh, the curve will look like this it will uh, go through origin so it will look like this this is our x square okay and another curve that is being given to us is y is equal to 8 under root x okay now this will also pass through the origin since we have no intercept here and it is square root function let us uh, uh, draw it like this okay so this is 8 under root x what we are being told we are being told to find out the area bounded by these two terms this very area this lens shaped area we need to find out okay first thing is we need to find the point where these two curves intersect okay so if y is equal to x square y is equal to 8 under uh, root x we need to equate them okay since lh is the same we can equate rhs that means x square should be equal to 8 under root x okay now let us do one thing here let us square on both sides okay so what will we get so this becomes x raised power 4 is equal to so 8 8s are 64 here and square and root will get cancelled we will be left with x that gives us 1x will get cancelled if i transpose it here it will get divided and 1x will get cancelled that gives us x cube will be equal to 64 which implies x will be equal to 64 is a perfect cube and we can write it in this fashion if i transpose it will become cube root here so we will get uh, you know 4 cube okay we have cube root here so this cube and this cube this uh, you know cube and cube root gets cancelled that means x is equal to 4 that implies the point where these two you know uh, curves intersect with each other is equal to we got the value of x is equal to 4 now we are in a position to find out the area between these two regions 
ओके फर्स्ट वी वी फाउंड द एरिया ऑफ दिस रेड कर्व अप टू एक्स इज इक्वल टू फोर ओके टू दिस वी सब्ट्रैक्ट द एरिया ऑफ दिस ब्लू कलर ओके वेन वी सब्ट्रैक्ट दिस वेन वी सब्ट्रैक्ट दिस इज फुल रीजन ओके दिस द एरिया विल बी गिवन बाय दिस रेड कर्व to this when we subtract this blue curve we will be left with lens shaped curve here okay so what we need to do so our e will be equal to the definite integral of 0 to 4 we need to find the area of blue curve that means 8 under root x can be written as 1 upon 2 dx So first we found out the area of this very region up to four. From this we subtract the area which is below this uh, below region. Okay. So to this we subtract the area bounded by that is from zero to four. And this is our x square function that is x square dx, which implies our e will be equal to. What is the integral of x to the power one upon four? X to the power, sorry, x to the power one upon two. Its integral is simply x to the power one upon two plus one divided by one upon two plus one. So this becomes x three upon two divided by three upon two. So here we will get uh, we have eight. Then we have uh, x to the power x to the power three upon two divided by Three upon two, okay. And we evaluate it from zero to four. To this, we subtract the area which lies below this blue color, uh, blue curve minus the integral of x square is simply x cube divided by four by power function rule. Nothing unusual here. And we also evaluate it from zero to four. Here, if we solve this, so eight divided by three upon two, we have eight divided by one divided by three upon two. This becomes eight divided by one into two upon three, so it is sixteen upon three. And let me write it here. So our e will be equal to. We get here sixteen uh, divided by three. Then we have. Let's evaluate uh, this now. At uh, x is equal to four for state upper limit. So in place of x, we will write four times four uh, raised power three upon two. And then we subtract and evaluate it at lower limit. Since lower limit is zero, this whole term will become zero. We will not evaluate it at lower limit. To this we subtract. Sorry, it is here x cube upon three. So we are left with one upon three uh, here. If I take it common, now we evaluate x at upper limit, which is four. So in place of x, we write four cube, and then evaluate, then subtract and evaluate it at lower limit, which is zero. So we will get zero again. Solving this will result as sixteen upon three. So four can be written as two square. Raised power three uh, upon two, two and two will get cancelled. We will get two cube, which is equal to eight. Here, minus here we will get four, four that sixteen, four that sixty-four divided by three. So this comes out to be when you solve this sixteen into eight divided by three, it will come out to be forty-two point six seven. To this way, I have to write sixty-three upon two. It will come out to be twenty-one point three three. Subtracting, we will get twenty-one point three four. That is the value of e, but we need to find out the value of thirty e. So our thirty e will be equal to thirty times the value of e is two one point three four, which comes out to be six forty point two six hundred forty. Point two. This is how do we find the area bounded by two curves? We were told to find out this very area. Okay, what we did? First, we found out the area of this whole region 
of this whole region okay from this we subtract the area which is below this below curve and the area which is left will be this very area which is bounded by these two curves the question is if x denotes the sum of numbers appearing on a throw of two six faced dice then the probability that uh, x's value is greater than 7 and less than 10 is we need to find out okay now we are being given two six faced dice okay when we have two six faced dice what is uh, the sample space sample space will be equal to 6 into 6 that means we will have 36 you know possibly outcomes and out of 36 events we need to find out the events that is sum of numbers should be either you know 8 or 9 okay we are being told x lies between 7 and 10 that means x should be either 8 or 10 we need to find out how many favorable outcomes are with x given the simple space of 36 okay now uh, to get sum of numbers is 8 we can have uh, you know 6 comes on first dice 2 comes on second dice or 2 comes on second dice 6 on first similarly we could have you know 5 on first 3 on second 3 on first 5 on second 4 on first or 4 on second same so this denotes the combination of sum of two numbers equal to 8 and what about 9 again let us say 6 comes on first 3 on second die or 3 on first 6 on second then we will have 5 4 4 5 okay then what is the probability that x lies between 7 and between 10 simple number of favorable outcomes number of favorable outcomes favorable outcomes okay how many outcomes are there one one two three four five six seven eight nine okay number of favorable outcomes is nine divided by sample space sample space so it will be equal to nine upon 36 which comes out to be one upon four which is equal to 0 0.25 okay that means 25 percent chances are that we will get a sum of uh, numbers equal to 8 or 9 is consider the Keynesian cross model with following features we are being given consumption function tax function income identity and also we are being given the marginal propensity to consume is equal to 0 0.7 and marginal tax rate is 0 0.2 we need to find out the Keynesian multiplier okay so Keynesian multiplier is simply equal to that is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus MPC and MPC is B times 1 minus t that means marginal tax rate so that results in we will get 1 divided by 1 minus the value of b is 0 0.7 0 0.7 times 1 minus the marginal tax rate is 0 0.2 0 0.2 when you solve this we will get Keynesian multiplier equal to that is equal to 2.2 Two seven okay.